Robert. <laughs> and now let us give a warm welcome to Reverend Michael Sternley. Good morning. You know, I've become acutely aware that I have to be more careful when I choose my, the titles for my talks. I came here one Sunday last year, and my title was, You Can't Get There From Here. <laughs> and of course, it was based on one of the classes in Mary Manon Morrissey's Prosperity Plus course, and the basic idea being that you can't get to where you want to be, attain what you want to attain, have the kind of life you want to live, uh, with the consciousness that you have now, because we'll always live the kind of life that we have the consciousness of. You first have to get the consciousness of whatever it is that you're seeking before you can have it. Well, it must have been some kind of terrible mix-up in my subconscious <laughs> mind, because I got lost on the way here. And, and arrived about 30 seconds before the service was supposed to uh, begin. Now, of course, this year Christmas falls on Sunday. Next Sunday is Christmas Day. Uh, and I saw no reason to cancel our service at Center for Spiritual Living Long Island because we've, the last time it fell on a Sunday was in 2011. And we held a service, and it worked out fine. There's a little drop off in attendance, but not, not too much. So I said, well, there's no reason not to schedule it. So I scheduled it. And I wanted to maybe approach it a little differently, because there is the usual Christmas talk, because there are certain themes of the holiday that relate to our ideas and our teaching. And I always like to cover those. But I thought, maybe. Let me do it a little differently. So I thought I'd approach it by first talking about when uh, Christmas was banned in Oliver Cromwell's England and also by the Puritans in some of the colonies. So I called the talk when Christmas was banned. And right, I put that in the program. I come to uh, church two Sundays ago. And I found out that basically I would be the only one there on Christmas Day. Uh, no practitioners, no staff ministers, no volunteers, no congregation. Pretty much everybody told me that they wouldn't be able to come that day. So it turns out Christmas really was banned. So that was the end of that. I canceled the service. So I was a little apprehensive about this morning because I didn't want to turn on the news and find out that World War III had broken out because I chose to talk about individual peace rather than world peace. So we'll see how that works out. Now my topic is individual peace. Uh, we can't seem to get peace collectively, so this morning we're going to find out how to get it uh, individually. We've had 2,000 years of shouting peace on earth, goodwill toward men, and it hasn't done uh, very much at all. Uh, we especially love to sing about it at Christmas time. And you might even have done some of that yesterday. So I know you weren't caroling. I read your email newsletter, as I know some of you read mine. Now, it hasn't done much because whether or not there's world peace depends on what is sometimes called race belief or the collective consciousness of everyone in the world. Uh, in fact, not only everyone now living, but everyone who has ever lived. Every thought, every word, every act has contributed to it. And until patterns of violence and war are erased from the collective consciousness, this universal subjectivity will continue to have them. Now, if you're one of those people who wants to be doing something to bring about world peace, uh, well, I have good news for you. You're already doing it. 
you're already doing it. Your very desire for it means that you're doing something about it. Because remember that each and every one of us is part of the collective consciousness, and the contents and quality of our consciousness uh, will change it in some way. You can think of it as like a big stew. And when you make a stew, you have a chunk of this kind of meat and a chunk of that kind of meat and you know, a piece of this vegetable and a piece of that vegetable. And each ingredient uh, contributes to the flavor of the whole thing. Well, if you start changing around things and you have, you know, different piece of meat or a different piece of vegetable, a different or more of one and less of the other, the flavor of the whole thing starts to change. So you can think of this collective consciousness as that. So through each one's thought, we're always affecting it, we're always doing something to change it for the better or for the worse. But there is a way to have individual peace. Now, individual peace is really peace of mind. So what is uh, peace of mind? Well, let me start by telling you a story about what it isn't. Sometimes it's helpful to first know what something isn't and then go on to find out what it is. Uh, and so the day after completing a, vip, a, vip, a vipassana, vipassana retreat, where he had spent nine days in silent meditation, uh, Dave shows up for work at the zoo. Now, seeing how chilled out Dave is, the head keeper puts him in charge of the tortoise enclosure. So Dave slowly walks over to the cages. At lunchtime, the head keeper checks on Dave only to see the cage door is wide open and all the tortoises are gone. Well, he runs up to Dave and asks, what happened to the tortoises? Well, Dave said very slowly, I opened the tortoise cage door and it was like, whoosh. <laughs> no, that's not the peace of mind we're talking about. <laughs> peace of mind is a sense of quiet, a sense of well-being, a sense that everything is all right. Uh, it's a sense that all life is available, all mind is available, all ideas are available, all health, life, love, and abundance is available to us. And what's more, this peace of mind is creative, because it's not just giving up everything so that you can be quiet. It's really a releasing of everything so that you can become more aware of your own great potential. Now this peace within us is never disturbed, uh, even if we're disturbed. While we're running around all upset and disturbed about this, that, or the other thing, this peace uh, remains within us. Now it's nice to know that it's always there, uh, but how do we actually experience it? Now, Tehillah Lichtenstein was a co-founder of the Jewish science movement. And Jewish science shares a lot of ideas with our teachings, the different New Thought teachings. In fact, when it was first founded uh, for a while, it was um, a member organization of the International New Thought Alliance. And so she wrote, it is within ourselves that serenity dwells. This tranquility is part of the residence of God within us, and it never leaves us. It may be overlaid and lost to our awareness, <coughs> but it is there waiting for us to bring it back as an active, beneficent force in our lives. Serenity is within us. <coughs> as healing is within us, as love and goodness are within us, as gifts of an indwelling divinity. They are ours when we do not block their expression. They are ours when we meet the conditions under which they will express themselves. They are ours when we seek them and recognize their presence as an outflow of the divine mind. 
So our project is to find out how to unblock it, how to meet these conditions under which it expresses itself. Now Charles Fillmore said there is a peace at the heart of everything, therefore there is a peace at the heart of my soul. Well, this is true, but how often really do we sense it? Because to sense it, we have to take the time and make the effort to sense it. Uh, we have to say to the world, quiet down. Uh, we have to not believe everything you hear, taste, touch, uh, and smell. See, there's a peace and you already have it. Already have it. It's not something you produce. Uh, it's something that you actually reveal to yourself. Uh, you don't cause it, uh, it's already there. And this is true of everyone, and so we can sense it within ourselves. Now, your consciousness is the beginning and end of all your experience. And when you want to, you can control consciousness. Or you can let it run wild. I wouldn't suggest doing that, but we're always free to let it run wild. We can control it or we can let it uh, run wild. Now, revealing this peace of mind means taking time to do your interior spiritual work. Interior spiritual work, because remember, we always work from the inside out, from the center to the circumference. And this work always focuses on the idea that you individualize the total possibility of life. And all of it is in you, all of it is for you, and all of it is good. So we need to go within ourselves and get quiet for a while. And I'm not talking about hours and hours of stillness, hours and hours of silence. Uh, you don't have to be like Ram Bahadur Bamjan, Bamjan, the so-called Buddha boy from Nepal, who said to spend months in meditation without eating or drinking. And you certainly don't want to be like the Indian religious leader Sri Ashutosh Maharaj, whose family is suing to have him declared legally dead and be cremated, uh, but whose followers have his body in a freezer and say that he's merely meditating and will come out of it when he's ready. <laughs> now, he's been in that freezer for over almost three years. <laughs> now, nothing like that. Just a little while, just a little time, enough time to get back to, um, to get just enough time to get our consciousness back to its spiritual center. Now, Abbot Anthony, one of the Desert Fathers of late antiquity, said, just as fish die if they remain on dry land, so monks remaining away from their cells or dwelling with men of the world lose their determination to persevere in solitary prayer. Therefore, just as the fish should go back to the sea, so we must return to our cells lest remaining outside, we forget to watch over ourselves interiorly. Well, what's the result of this interior work? One day, a young man applied for a job as a farmhand. And when the farmer asked for his qualifications, he said, I can sleep when the wind blows. Well, this puzzled the farmer. But he liked the young man, and he hired him. A few days later, the farmer and his wife were awakened in the night by a violent storm. Uh, they quickly began to check things out to see if everything was secure. They found the shutters of the farmhouse had been securely fastened. A good supply of logs had been set next to the fireplace. And the young man slept soundly. The farmer and his wife then inspected their property. They found that the farm tools had been placed in the storage shed, safe from the elements. The tractor had been moved into the garage, the barn was properly locked, and even the animals were calm. 
So all was well. The farmer then understood the meaning of the young man's words, I can sleep when the wind blows. Because the farmhand did his work loyally and faithfully when the skies were clear, uh, he was prepared for the storm when it broke. So when the wind blew, he wasn't afraid and he could sleep in peace. And so that's peace of mind, the ability to see the spiritual life isn't a problem-free life. The problems come and they will go. The difference is that there will be less of them and you'll be able to handle them, know how to handle them and handle them without stress and without anxiety and without drama, unless you want some drama. Some people like that. It's the result, that's what peace of mind is. It's the result of doing the interior spiritual work that unblocks and creates the conditions under which it can express itself. And I can't think of a better way to conclude than with this affirmation from one of the readings in a book called Richer Living uh, by Ernest Holmes and Raymond Charles Barker. It's a book filled with a reading for every day of the year. And I like particularly this one. It says, I am poised and established in the one mind, and nothing can disturb the calm peace of my soul. I declare peace, and peace is mine. For God responds to me as I think his way. I assume that my world, in all its ways, is filled with right action. I live in faith, and I demonstrate order with ease. And so on, Celeste.